Good morning, everyone, and uh, great to be with you. Oh, is it oh, still good morning? Yeah, uh, great to be with you this morning. And um, you know, in in a modern individualistic society. Preaching this passage is not that easy. <laughs> it's quite graphic and uh, you know, lots of challenging subject is going on. Um, yesterday, we, we, we gave a spontaneous invitation to uh, a picnic uh, in, our, in our park to our neighbors. You know, a couple of our neighbors came. And uh, so uh, the, the, the girl, so she brought a cat and uh, then she said, uh, then they said, we are going to plan to, uh, uh, to bring a, uh, to buy a puppy, you know, so we are going to have, so they're quite excited. They show the photo and uh, the puppy is so cute, you know, we are not pet people, but it was cute. No offense. Um, and, uh, you know, so in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Western style, I said, oh, you know, that's so cute, you know, so in Indian style, okay, you got a puppy, you know, so, yeah, so. Uh, so, you know, so, um, and then I, I was a bit curious, you know, wh what's the size of this puppy when it's grow growing and, you know, so what is the adult, uh, uh, an adult size, you know, so um, then I, uh, you know, look at the internet and I can see that this puppy with a long ear and kind of, you know, so it's, a, uh, it's, it's going to be kind of things, but I was a little bit shocked by the the adult picture of that puppy because it was not cute because I have a memory attached to this type of dog, specific kind of uh, breed, what happened in Cambodia when, when we were spending time, our well, first year of marriage. The story is uh, the church leader allowed us to stay in their house because when they were going for a holiday, that was the last uh, couple of weeks we were supposed to stay there before we, uh, uh, you know, Catherine uh, moving back to England. I was planned to come, but I was not able to come because of the visa issues. And we decided to look after this dog, you know, exciting, you know. So we did all the research and book, read all the book and did li listen all the TED talk. And we can do it. We can do it, you know. So we decided to do it. And one day we decided to cook a barbecue and this is a three-story building on the top of the roof and we set up a barbecue and marinated it and we went to the local uh, market to buy some meat and everything. And this is a well-trained dog, you know, amazing dog, you know. So if you ask them to sit, it will sit, it will stand, you know. So even it, it, the dog understood my Indian English, you know. That was a breakthrough. So I thought it's a contextualized dog living in Cambodia, uh, raised by a Malaysian uh, woman and an English uh, man, and it's very much contextualized. Long story short, you know, so I left the barbecue there, and the dog is excited, he say everything is there, so it's all being fed. When I came down to take some matchbox, and I was going up, I can see this dog coming down, licking the face, you know, like going like that. I was like, okay, I gave you some food. Uh, nearly half an hour ago. So what's going on now? You know. So I was thinking, like, Catherine, we are going to have a barbecue. You know, went went upstairs. The dog ate all the marinated food. You know. It's just gone. You know. And uh, I was so excited. I was filled with the spirit and speaking tongues. No, that didn't happen. I was so outraged. How dare you spoil my my barbecue? You know? So. That was the shock I had yesterday. So at the end of the meeting, I'm still suffering from the trauma. I'll be standing there. Feel free to come and lay hands and pray for me to recover from the trauma. You know, and after 13 years, I'm still suffering. So I, I can't think about this dog. Dog, dog is going to be in my neighborhood most of the time, you know, seeing. So I need a breakthrough. That's uh, nothing to do with this preach. I thought I should share with you to release uh, my, uh, you know, just to, to, to relieve myself before I preach. Okay, now the difficult subject. <laughs> Genesis chapter 21. If I wrote that story, I would have been finished by then. I would have been wrote, Isaac was born and they happily lived ever after. What a fantastic place to stop and to give an autograph who wants to come and get my story. But unfortunately, there is... Uh, another chapter, Genesis chapter 22. We just heard that one. Sometimes later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, 
Yes, God, thank you. I can do that. I'm happy to do that one. Where is his smile? Hello, somebody get his smile back. You know, he's just moving away with the Hagar, you know, to bring him back. Then the next verse is, your only son, okay, whom you love, okay, and his name is Isaac. You can feel the silence, and you can see what he was going through at that time. Go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. People struggle historically this, reading this passage because of the graphic nature of this incident. You know, how could a loving God asking for a cosmic child abuse? You know, how, how could God can say, I'm loving, at the same time asking something he gave in the previous chapter, you know. So after waiting and waiting, and they start living and cherishing this amazing gift from God, a promise of God, and not only that, a lot of things attached to it, and now God is asking, I want this child to be burned, offering on the mountain, I will show you. As a father, it is very, very difficult time. Before I move forward, um, I want to come to, uh, I want to bring into a context. For example, if you are looking through your window to a garden or somewhere like it, uh, might be 20 or like a 50 or 100 meters away, you can see that people having a big argument, two people having a big argument, and you talk to your wife and say, I can't believe that. They are so aggressive and you know how do they, how are they talking to one another it, it's unbelievable you know i think they should go for a family counseling or count of you know they need some sort of help you know so uh, the later you went to that park and uh, you understood that oh we know this couple then we asked them or you asked them how are you are you okay then they said do you know this is my brother came to visit me after 20 years. I can't believe that, you know. So we were having a great time. And we were having hugging and hitting and, you know, having a great time together. How do you feel when you hear that? From 100 meters away, you're seeing something and you zoom in and you made a conclusion. You, your conclusion is, what a horrible family. They need help. But when they came to them and see that picture really closely, they understood this is not a chaos. This is something more than that. This is the problem when people, especially non-Christians or, or people like Richard Dawkins, you know, so when they pick up passages like this to rip God away into pieces to show him how cruel he is, but what he's making, missing is the God of the Bible from beginning to end. He's loving and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's rich in love. As we are going through this passage, we have seen that again and again. This man lived in a no man's land, an idol worship. Oh, God brought him. God saved him. God rescued him. God gave him a promise. God walked with him. He lied. He cheated. He messed and everything. But here is the sovereign God decided to come down and have a fellowship with this, this broken man and call him Abraham is my friend. Completely missing the bigger picture and pinning down to one specific thing to tear God apart. History tried it again and again, but never ever happened in the history because God is unchanging. He is everlasting. He is, an, he is a forgiving God. He is an awesome God. He is our heavenly father. He has a track record. He is an amazing God. Hallelujah. We know that. And we are the living experience of that. He is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. So are we seeing a faithful God? One who justifies the ungodly? Or we are seeing something else. So it's really understand to under, it, 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 in, in, interesting to understand the context to see the bigger picture. Let's walk through the story. When God asked him to be sacrificed, you know, Isaac to be sacrificed on the altar, what was Isaac's response? Yes, sir, I'm going to do it now. 
He didn't do that one. I'm your obedient servant. He didn't do that one. But the scripture saying, early in the morning, in the next morning, Abraham got up. One of the commentators says in this way, why that place there? If you're going for a holy day, how many of you sleep well the night before? Well, I have three alarms sometimes. The excitement will always drag me down and I'm awake. Is it six o'clock? No, it's only 12 past 10, 10 minutes after you've gone to bed. Okay, we'll go back again. Two o'clock, three o'clock, you know. So, so here, a father waited for years for the son and God is asking him to be sacrificed. This is my thinking. He didn't sleep whole night. He get up in the morning. Abraham got up and uh, noticed his donkey. Interesting. He is like a king there. He's like a queen. Else of going to the, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the kitchen and making a toast for the breakfast. She's the queen. You just ask. People are there to see your body language. You just, you know, just to use some uh, body language, things are there. But here is a man, like a king, a rich man, who is a ruler of that land. He got up in the morning and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants when he had cut enough wood. Who cut the wood? Abraham. He didn't ask the servants to do that one. He did it. This is my understanding. He was going through tough time. Sometimes you want to see the superhero father of faith. Yes, sir. But he is going through absolutely shockingly broken time. And he cut in a foot. Sometimes we might do gardening to get rid of our frustration. Sometimes we do we paint to get rid of our frustration. Sometimes we go to the gym <sighs> to get rid of frustration. Nobody anywhere near at that time. Careful. Give space. Something is going on. Here is a man cutting wood for the burnt offering. I'm not saying he was angry with God, but the emotional trauma, don't neglect that. Throughout the history, we can see that. People face that again and again. Moses said, I can't do it. I can't do it. Mary said, how is it possible since I'm a virgin? Gideon said, no, I can't. Nobody said, yes, sir, I'm going to do that one. This is our God working with emotionally chaotic, broken, unfaithful, feared, scared human beings are trying to hide and run away from our calling and responsibility. But here is a heavenly father coming to us and talking to us where we are at to bring us back to his sovereign plan to demonstrate he is a good God. Elijah, where are you hiding after seeing the amazing, spectacular miracle? He wants to commit suicide. He wants to finish his life. Then God spoke to him. He get strengthened because you need to anoint two more kings now. Not only that, you have another one coming. Elisha, that's going to carry the double portion. That is our God. Here, God is coming and meeting him. Throughout that journey. On the third day, Abraham took up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Sometimes we can say, oh, that is Abraham. He knew it. That's the way things are going to be allocated because last night God said, I have a plan and it's a secret plan. What's the plan? You know, you just pretend you lay the sun you, that one, I would say that, Abraham, Abraham, okay, yeah, agreed, yeah, so you just tell the seven, you don't have to tell anyone, you know, so this is our plan. He didn't knew it. 
He didn't do it. Only thing he knew, I lived in no man's land. I was nobody. But this God found me, walked with me, and he proved he is a faithful God. I have fears, I have worries, I have baggages, I lied, I cheated, lots of that's my track record. But when I'm looking at him, he is God and he is faithful. So I'm going to step out and follow him. So following God and following God by faith doesn't mean that everything is going to be exciting and you have a super faith now. God is a God that can understand our strengths and weaknesses and he's going to walk alongside with you and he's going to walk with us to prove that he is a faithful God. Abraham took the wood from the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And two of them went together. Verse 7 is one of the most difficult passages in that portion. I think it's one of the most difficult passages in Old Testament. There's no other passage like that in the Old Testament. If a son is asking one of the most difficult questions to the, to the father... What's the question? The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Daddy, we are something missing. Father, we are something missing. We cannot offer something without, the, without something on the altar. You know, where is that? And Abraham's answer was, God himself provide the lamb for the burnt offering my son. And two of them went on together. One of the most difficult passages. You might remember, you know, later in the New Testament, similar conversation between a father and the son in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that after a couple of days, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. But he asked, if it's possible if it's possible, Father, is any other way? Here, Abraham replied. There, there was no reply. Why? There is no alternative solution. That was the only way for the salvation of the broken, rejected people like us. It was silent. That's why Jesus cried, Lama, Lama, Saba, Lama, Sabatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he talked about his father many times, about his son many times. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. But this time, it was silent because there was no plan B. By thinking, us. That's why John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son for us. So on the time day, he's the difficult conversation. And later we can see that one. When they reach the place God had told about, uh, him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. And he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. If there was a big Guinness book record competition was there, he would have been one the fastest knife dropping competition ever. What was the response? Do not lay hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. 
because that won't fill the purpose. Now I know that, this is really important, you fear God. Shall we say that together? It's not singing, you can talk, you know, I think. You fear God. You fear God. Are we able to talk? No. Is it legally not allowed? No, I think so. Don't worry about that, you know. So I want to, I don't want to be arrested today, you know, so. Because you have withheld, you did not withheld from me your son, your only son. So here's a conversation going on. What's happening? You fear God because you have not withheld from me your son. What? Yes. But who gave the son? God gave the son. Who gave the promise? God gave the promise. Who opened the womb of Sarah? God did that. Who gave the, 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 who did the miracle? You know, God did that. Then here is a, like, hey, you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. That's so interesting how God is treating the gifts God has given in our life. Once it's given to us, he wants to give that full ownership and freedom to us. How and when we are going to use that gift. How could I say, I am the God, I'm sovereign. That is mine. Can I have my Isaac back? Did he say that? No. Can I have my promise back? No, he didn't say that one. This is yours. Now, your choice. What are you going to do with your precious now, even though that's fully holy, a blessing from me to you? Abraham looked up there in a thicket. Uh, a, a thicket. He saw a ram. Caught by its horns, he went over and looked up the ram and sacrificed is as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, that place, the Lord will provide. And uh, to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. God is saying, because you've done this one, because you're feared, and there's a promise also after that. God gave that promise beforehand. In Genesis, we can see that one in, in Genesis 15, you know. Then here in verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from seven a second time and said, I will swear by myself, declare the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. This is amazing. Our obedience can create amazing things in the sovereign will of God. That is the way God has invited us into his sovereign plan. When we are giving that belongs to God by obeying and trusting home, rather than withholding it, we are proclaiming, Lord, we want to be part of that. We want to be part of your plan because you are good and you are good and your love endures forever. We want to be part of that. So I don't want to find my security by holding things. I don't want to find my security and identity or hold on things. I want to find my security by following you, God, not after things, but after him. That's the real security. God wants to prove that to Abraham. I am your shield and your greatest reward. Don't cling to one thing I have given you. Bless you. Let your blessing Turn your heart to me more than ever before. Let your wife turn your heart to follow me more than ever before. Let my blessings you have experienced in my life uh, uh, for turn to you more than, you know, turn to me more than ever before. Whatever we're receiving, let that be a catalyst. Let that be a place. Let that be a platform to glorify God more than ever before. What happened to Israelites, you know, when they were blessed and they were better than other nations, what they did, they run away from God. They turned their, uh, their, 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 their life away from God. That ended up in big disaster. God is reminding his covenant with Abraham through your seed. Can you see that? I, I love that verse, you know, the, the nations will be blessed. The nations will be blessed. In Romans 
Uh, Genesis chapter 5 verse 6, Abraham believed in God and he, it, he credited it to him as righteousness. So here you can see that God is reminding his covenant and Abraham's obedience to God credited to him as his righteousness. We will look to a couple of passages and uh, uh, we will move forward. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 to 25. When you get time, you know, please read this passage again when you go home, when you get time. Again, as hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Remember, that was not, yes, sir, faith. <laughs> Fragile, broken, but decided to follow God. Just as he had said to him, he had been said to him, so shall your offspring be without weakening in his faith. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. I love that passage. When I was reading that again, I came back again and again. He faced the fact. What is our facts this morning? Lay dead. God, I'm scared. I can't concentrate while I'm praying, you know. I have an unbelieving husband. I have an unbelieving wife, you know. My things are in chaos, you know. I can't sleep. I'm struggling with lots of things, you know. You might have a list of things there, but here he faced the fact his body was as good as dead. Full stop. Since he was about 200 years old, age is gone body is gone. What about the wife? The womb was also dead. That is the fact. So following God doesn't mean that denying the facts that in your life. Not ignoring the facts that's in your life. Not trying to neglect the darkness you are living now. It's actually fully recognizing it with its full intensity but yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God. Hallelujah. That's different. In the midst of mental health struggles, in the midst of fears, in the midst of worries, in the midst of all the battle going on in work or house or children or personal battle. No, you're not waiting for a time to settle everything, then I will follow God. No, in the midst of that, you are declaring everything is clouded, everything is dark, but I want to stretch my hand to God knowing that he is my savior. He can turn the impossibility into possibility because he's God. That is faith. I was so encouraged by testimonies this morning. And was sharing about the things that are holding us back. Carries was sharing, you know, just to connecting with the 15 different people to connect with, to do the work. The hurdles after hurdles. But we are coming to a God. He is different. You can bring your baggage. <laughs> no, no offices want to bring your baggage to the, the office. They say, clear it. Take care, break. Our God is different. Bring it everything. Okay. Are you heavy and laden? Oh, bring it. Give it to me. You know, okay. Are you worried? Come to me. Oh, no. Are you thirsty? Come to me. We have a God. He's not going to put barriers after barriers because of our unqualification. He is a God to welcome us. We are disqualified. Is it right, disqualified, or inqualified, or not qualified? Correct. It's correct. That's my English wife with an English teaching degree now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so our weakness are the qualifying certificate for us to come to this living God. How many of you got that one, that kind of certificate? Goodness me, I'm coming to a holy place, you know. We are. Here's Abraham, broken, and coming to this one. Can I read forward? Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises, but was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God. Don't shout it, whisper it, or say in your heart, strengthened in faith. 
but was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. That's God. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone. That's exciting. You know, I can spend hours and hours in that passage. You know, it might need like a five or six series for this one. You know, so God credited him. It's not just for Abraham, but we are the beneficiaries of that story after story. And that story is going to produce you from again, you know. You're going to produce that to other people, you know. The story of your story is going to trigger many nations will be blessed because the faithfulness of God, the promise of God, God has given to Abraham is fulfilled in you now. And through you, the nations will be blessed. It's a domino effect. It's a reproducing. The word it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us. To him, God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him. Listen. Who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. What is our hope? What is our hope? You know, in the midst of cloud, in the midst of all the blockages, in the midst of all the darkness, in the midst of unbelief, we can be surrounded with the, 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 all these problems, but in the midst of that, not, not denying the fact, facing the fact, we can declare trusting in God, trusting in Jesus, the way provided by God for my salvation. I'm going to step out and believe in Him. God made it that simple. I don't know how, just believing in God, trusting in the life of Jesus and what he has done, credited him, credited to us as righteous. He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. James 2, 21 to 22, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, you see that his faith and his action were worked together. His faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled, uh, fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. I love that passage. God never called Abraham a liar. A cheater. You are unfaithful. I don't want to work with you. But his track record, awful. God highlighted sin, but never labeled Abraham in that way. He's my friend. I don't know, if, it, if it was Abraham, my friend, I would say, yeah, he's kind of a distant friend. God said, no, he's my friend. Okay, it might, yeah, take him, but I don't want him, you know. But God said, he's my friend. God is calling you. You are my friend. You are my children. He's not ashamed to call you as our children, his children. So let's come to his presence with assurance and knowing that because we have Jesus, the Lamb of God, sacrifice for our sin. John said, look at the lamb who carries the sins of this world. At that time, Isaac went home because a lamb or ram died in his place. Now we can live. The ultimate lamb of God was died in our place. That's why we can live in freedom because his righteousness is our righteousness. He lived for our righteousness. He died to pay our uh, for our sin so we can live in freedom and we can be friendship with God. Let me conclude. How shall we get right with God? Forgiven, acquitted, counted as righteous in his place rather than guilty and ungodly. The answer is by trusting in God who justifies the ungodly. We all qualify for that one. Trusting in God the one who justifies the ungodly. Abraham gave his son 
but a lamb died in his place so that he could live. God gave his son or gave himself so that we can give and live to be a blessing to the nations. We can say, now I know God, you love me because you gave your son. Now I know, you know. God said to Abraham, now I know. You didn't withhold your son. So that's why a ram dying in this place. Now we can say to God, God, and now I know you love me because you gave your son. That shows you love me and I want to follow you.